Welcome back, everyone. And uh, now it's time for our keynote lectures. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote lecturer, Luca Di Blasi, who is professor of philosophy at the Theological Faculty of the University of Bern in Switzerland. And uh, his research focuses on theoretical approaches to religion and the religious dimension of philosophy. And other fields of research include modern continental philosophy, political theology, and uh, cultural theory. Among his many publications, let me just uh, emphasize three that uh, are particularly relevant for our seminar today, namely a paper called Resuming Conflict, Benedict's Grace Invocation and the Limit of Dialogue. That recently uh, appeared in the Philosophical Journal of Conflict and Violence. And a book that you can see on the slides, Dezentrierungen, Beiträge zur Religion der Philosophie im 20. Jahrhundert. And another paper with the title Vielfalt und Verschiedenheit zur Gegenstrebigkeit der Diversität in Diversity Trouble. Maybe we can res resolve some of the trouble <laughs> through a dialogue today. Yeah, and the title of his lecture today is Questioning One's Own Epistemic Superiority. And let me also introduce our next speaker so that we immediately after the first keynote lecture will have the second keynote lecture and then a dialogue between the two um, and then questions and um, discussion also with the audience. Yeah, our second keynote lecturer is Elad Lapidot, who is professor for Hebraic studies at the Université de Lille. He has taught philosophy, Jewish thought and Talmud at many universities, for instance, also University of Bern, where he has been a colleague to uh, Luca and the Humboldt Universität in Berlin, and also the Freie Universität. His research focuses on questions concerning the relation between knowledge and politics. And let me just mention three publications relevant for our seminar today, namely Jews Out of the Question, a critique of anti-Semitism, anti Heidegger and Jewish thought, difficult others, this is an edited volume. And Être sans mot dire, la logique de sein und Zeit. The title of his lecture today is On the Ethics of Not Speaking. And uh, I'm so much looking forward to your lectures and discussions, Luca and Elad. I will stop screen sharing now so that we have, um, so that we can upload your slides. And now I give the word to Luca. Yes, thank you very much, Claudia, and um, you and, and, and both for the um, organization of this um, 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 meeting and for um, for inviting me to come here. Um, so thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Essie. And now I. Um, would like to say something about my my topic. I um, so actually the the title has changed slightly. It's not and it's it's now questioning if you can see one's own epistemic superiority and its limit. So if this is a too too small changes, and now I can just explain something about uh, say something about this epistemic arrogance understood as an under unquestioned and uncritical understanding of one's own epistemic superiority towards others could be called an epistemic vice. Accordingly, questioning one's own epistemic superiority should be an epistemic virtue. And this virtue now, um, so it's first element here regarding our conference. And the second is that the, um, this virtue seems to me to be a good precondition for dialogue. Um, if you are used to question the superiority of your truth claims, 
you might be less arrogant and it might be easier to be curious and open toward, towards others and in consequence to get a, maybe get in a productive, what we call productive dialogue with them. That is why I choose questioning one's own epistemic superiority as a topic for this meeting. And I put epistemic in brackets because I uh, noticed that actually it's, I, my examples sometimes are broader than just epistemic. It's also moral. It's also questioning their own moral superiority. And so I don't want to be, to, to limit my, my talk to this specific or historical, you know, um, if you think that you are in historical progress in regarding others, it's also kind of superiority, but it's not, not so clear whether it can be called epistemic or not. So and actually, I'm not so much interested in this kind of discussions, but uh, I just wanted to, to make it clear. Um, so in a second, I, in my talk, I would like to investigate this question of, um, in, by means of one of my favorite hermeneutical figures, the Kippit, or the ambiguous figure. Multi-civil figure, it much sometimes called. I, but I actually I use I like the term, the German term Kippbild. It's very nice, and I will uh, uh, mostly use this term. And I will do this in three steps. Firstly, I would like to show that the Kippbild enables a specific hermeneutic, uh, Kippbild hermeneutics, which already makes possible to relativize one's own claims of superiority insofar as for this questioning of what was previously unreflect unreflectively taken for granted is fundamental. What at first appeared to be an image turns out to be a mere aspect. What was seeing turns out to be seeing as. For this shift, the so-called aha moment is the central Prerequisite. The counter figure are uh, figures are accordingly those who are closed minded, who seem unable, naive, or unwilling, um, ignorant in a moral, just moral sense, to see things in another way to perform an aspect change. In a ste second step, I want to show that self relativization of one way of seeing as seeing as gives birth to a new and more hidden form of epistemic superiority. The implicit assumption of an epistemic superiority is related to the fact that the relativization um, of the own seeing as seeing as is accompanied by the perception of a new aspect and this offers the possibility to see the matter from the other side as well. My aim is to present a possibility to become aware of this superiority through the very same kippled. It consists in noticing that by assuming our epistemic superiority, we align ourselves precisely with those from whom we thought we were positively distinct. Instead of a new aspect appearing, that differentiates one image into two aspects, as in the case of the aha moment, a difference between me and the picture that I made of the other disappears. Instead of an aha moment, I speak therefore of a negative aha moment. In a third and final step, I would like to question this question. So uh, there are three kinds of Question in a certain sense. How far can we go in questioning our own epistemic or moral or political superiority? Are there situations like the current one in Eastern Europe, in which the willingness to engage in moral and epistemic self questioning ceases to be a virtue and turns instead into a kind of vice, a weakening towards violence, for example? Do we bump up against the limits of the self of self questioning in the face of existential threats like a war? And this actually is also a question which um, came out of a dialogue with, with you, uh, Claudia. And so uh, this is 
I'm curious to, to, to hear what you think about my answer. So first, the aha moment. This is my first part. Um, some words about Kipilda and biggest figures, because I'm, I'm not sure whether I can just um, presuppose that everybody is, is um, familiar with them. In 1932, the Swiss naturalist Louis Albert Necker, um, he, uh, so it's, he's often regarded as a scientific discoverer of the ambiguous image. Of course, if you, even if you read some philosophical history of philosophy, you will see that it's not, not that true. And I was just um, for two months in, in Rome. Uh, and in the Museo Nazionale Romano, I discovered, for example, this beautiful mosaic, where you have of clear this arc, multi multi-stable figures. These are ambiguous figures. You, you can see they can switch, so to speak, from one perspective to the other. So this, at least the figures, uh, was known, and I, I cannot imagine that it was not only also somehow reflected. But uh, but this is not interesting, not not important for us. I um. Just, I also want to, to, to indicate that actually that different Kipbild, to speak of a Kipbild hermeneutics or the Kipbild or the ambiguous figures is already a kind of abstraction which doesn't, um, it's not, 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 not very correct actually. It not, it doesn't take, it's not mixed, how you say, gives, takes justice to, to the phenomenon because we, we uh, if you an analyze different Kipilda more accurately, you will see that they have important differences. For example, even the difference that you think that the multi-stability multi -stability or the instability of a Kipilda is just a binary one, that it can be seen in one way or the other, is somehow um, not necessarily a necessary condition for a Kipilda. At least one can question this because there are multi-stable figures which permit to see them in, in a much more complex way ways. It depends on how you uh, define uh, Kipit in order then to, to, to indicate whether this is, for example, here a Kipit or not. You can also, uh, there's another possibility if you are familiar with Malevich, the black square in a, in a white, um, I think, uh, um, so it's a black in white um, garment or something. It, it, it can be seen as a kit build. You can see, uh, because you can play with the foreground and background. You can switch then instead of a black um, square, you see a kind of dark background. And then there's a kind of window, for example. You can go back and forth. This is possible with many, many things. And uh, But I but this is maybe not a kit build because it is, um, so and this is, Something which seemed to be uh, relevant for the, the kit build is that this what I uh, just mentioned, and this is why I call this chap chapter here "aha" um, a moment. It has to be uh, something, uh, one feature which already Necker in his uh, publication emphasized, and why he became, so to speak, why it became a phenomenon for him, why it appeared to him. And this is the suddenness and involuntariness of this phenomenon. So it, uh, it, um, there is a moment precisely these characteristics are what made it a phenomenon since it is through them that the ambiguous figure appeared to him and made him want to explain it and to get control of it. So if you read the, the, the paper of Necker, you can see that he discovered this, um, this cube, no? And then, uh, from, in a moment, he saw it that it could change the. No, you know, you you can see. No, the, it can change the. Can be the foreground and the background can change. No, um, and in the moment it happens, you ah aha now I see it. Now this is the moment where it. If this is the first time, at least involuntary, more or less. I, don't, I think you cannot just. Uh, you have no control about this, but later on, then you gain some kind of control and. Uh, this is specific, I think, for for the kit build, and this is maybe not not clearly the case here. And this in this case, it's not that clear whether you have a similar moment because it's in certain sense it's too complex. The binary difference is, is fits better with this sudden moment when you have 
many, many possibilities to see AG, then this uh, strong uh, difference uh, disappears. Um, now I want to go more deeper in my specific um, hermeneutics, and in this, for this, I need a specific kitbird. It's it's this kitbird here, this famous one, the duck rabbit one, um, is so to speak fit is. Um, can be used is more useful from my my specific approach because here what happens is that a new aspect appears out of an image which is not 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 that case in, in the Necker cube you can or other the Rubin ways the famous one there are specific yeah this is so it's another uh, more more different more more difficult actually more complex but this here is clear now you have a you see in the first the first moment maybe a duck and um then suddenly you you ah no now now i see the the rabbit or vice versa so what happens here now one in in a naive sense you can you could say okay you had first one aspect and then you saw the other aspect and this is very often it's described that way, but it is not not accurate because you had initially you had no apps. This is a, my point that I made in already ten years ago in my book, and it's also um, published in, in my book Disintrierungen. In the in the beginning, you have an image, you see a duck or an image of a duck, and out of this image, when you suddenly see the rabbit. The rabbit is from the very beginning is an aspect because you you saw already the duck before. And retrospectively, this new aspect aspectualizes or um, relativizes the former picture in an aspect. Now it's just an aspect, but it was not from the beginning. You don't see immediately. And I had here quite technical actually um introduction to the kit built by Wittgenstein. And so I, I skipped it away, but I thought it's maybe less dialogical if I, I start with a more technical thing. But you we can also discuss about this. But if you if you are interested, this is what is um, specific for for the kit build. What I was very much interested um is this difference between between something that you see where you used to, you think this is the this is reality, so to speak. And then out of the blue, it comes something new from where everything appears differently. Kuhn would probably have said it's a new paradigm where you see that the world uh, is, is different. And, uh, you know, for example, you are used to think that the, 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 the sun is uh, um, turning around the world, the earth. And then if you manage to see it the other way around, everything is different, no? And now you cannot, but my point is actually that there is still a difference between these two aspects because you're very used to the first one. And in, and if you use the um, Kippelt as a hermeneutical tool to understand that such more, let's say, existential um, habits or, or cultural habits, then you can, um, then it becomes interesting because then you can say, it makes a difference when you saw first the earth as stable, stable, even though you didn't reflect on it. So you had no, not in a second order perspective on your own perspective. You, you saw just, it is clear, the sun is moving. Um, and it is a different, and then as a next, second step, you see, no, it's, it's the other way around. Because still, the, say so you are, still used to see it in a, in a specific way. And so so this is what you, then you can reflect. I, actually, I wanted to also to mention it. I think that for your project, this could be interesting also to reflect the difference between second person and second order. Because this is a difference, no? And it's not, not, not the same. You can also be the second order of your own observations. But you are not a second person. No? You, you, um, so, um, and I, I would suggest that this could be also fruitful for, for our dialogue. 
Yeah, we will see that it's probably there are people who are already in going with it. Okay. What is interesting here is that what um uh, in in regarding my own um talk is that uh in a certain sense what happens is a fundamental relativization of what appeared to be just was unquestioned was unquestioned that it was a duck and then after this so to speak um occurrence um um the appearance of something new uh, you have in a certain sense to write about this apparent stable knowledge now you become aware that actually it could be seen in a different way and this of course can be then um um uh, developed uh, that you can say actually we get used to kind of second order perspective where we can question everything we see see as maybe probably something that we see as and probably you can see it in a different way so you relativize your own uh, stable stability of the, your own perspectives and are at, at the same time um more um, apt more more you know, um, maybe um, trained to deal with differences, no? And, and not only that you are, you can accept that someone else has a different view, but you even embrace new perspectives, no? Oh, wow, great. And now I see even there's another possibility, no? And this maybe is, um, could be um, a reason why um, this uh, kippi that became, in, especially in postmodern times, so um, popular. No, and not only Kuhn but Wittgenstein are major figures for postmodern thought, and uh, because I think it's it, it fits quite well with the kind of embracement of diversity, of plurality, of pers perspectives in uh, opposition to a modality which was seen more, in a certain sense, narrow-minded uh, in in that sense. Okay, I skip now my um, the whole more technical part regarding um, um, Kip Builder and also my own um, reflection. But if you're interested in a kind of deepening this this uh, approach, you can of course also read my my article on on this. And now I skip to a new a thing, which is actually was not brand new. I developed this last year in, in this for the conference, uh, which a lot uh, have has already mentioned. I think here or no in the, the private discussion. But it was it's not it's but it's quite new. And this is um, the negative aha moment. I think um, so. The relativization and expect aspectualization of seeing as a count has a counter figure. And this is instead of the one who is called by, by Wittgenstein aspect blind, aspect blind. The term itself expresses already a certain devaluation and blindness is a classic and certainly not unproblematic um, example of pre privation, not privation the lack of the good that is expected. So if you're not familiar with this term, the stone is cannot see, but it's not blind. It's not a, a privation if the stone doesn't see, because it's not, to speak, in the essence of the stone, it's not, uh, not this. Other while for, um, for a dog, for example, or an animal, which, uh, which is, is assumed to be able to see when it is cannot see, is called blind. This is a privation. And um, accordingly, the expression aspect blindness articulates the non-existence of a skill that is expected to exist, namely to be able to see different aspects or to perform this aspect change. Even though the first aspect change at least happens as a said somehow involuntarily and can therefore not be completely demanded you cannot just but you have to see no, directly it's difficult but still uh, this uh, notion of aspect blindness implies at least a kind of um possibility that we should be able to 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 perform this by understanding the inability to perform an aspect change to be 
able to read and to be able to realize their own perception as pri as privation, as deficiency, it can easily become a symbol for an epistemic vice, for a narrow-minded dogmatism. And as such, this assumed inability to see other aspects can also be seen as politically. And now I come to my my slide here, my my the picture, my cartoon. So quite, did you know, did someone already know this cartoon? It, I think it's quite, I thought it's quite famous, but actually I noticed that many people don't know it. Actually it's better, better for me, so I, you can just have fun with this, um, uh, with this cartoon from the New Yorker from 2014. No? Um, you can read it, no? Is it, I don't need to, it's not need, do I need to, do I have to, to read it, the title? But I, I said, there can be no peace until they renounce their rabbit god and accept our duck god. The ambiguous uh, image, the kid bill, serves here to represent a political theological conflict between two disputants. The connection to the field of religion is striking here. One is tempted to think of medieval crus crusaders and Islamic holy warriors, and to see them as representatives of current conflicts between Christianity, Christians and Islamic fundamentalists. Both sides seem to conflict with each other because they do not see what the observer can see, because they each see only one aspect, one viewpoint. Because they do not see this, they overestimate the difference and thereby idolize a one-sidedness which turns them into the intolerant God warriors of their absolutized aspect. The picture thus seems to belong to a long enlightenment tradition in which religious is quickly equated with dogmatic and fanatical. If we look at the problem from the point of view of a Kippel hermeneutics, does it not co consist exactly in the fact that, as Wittgenstein would say, two diametrically opposed forms of aspect blindness collide with each other here, whereby one side cannot see the picture object rabbit, the other the picture object duck? A political Hippelt hermeneutics would accordingly conceptualize the conflict of the two disputants in Paul North's cartoon as a conflict between two instances of aspect blindness as a consequence of two limitations and try to show the parties or to demonstrate the parties that they are not able to recognize their seeing as, as such. And thus are to relativize it that they do not recognize that in what they dogmatically misunderstood as seeing an objective fact and a thinking and interpreting is inscribed inseparately but undistinguishably from this seeing. As soon as, on the other hand, the relativization succeeds, the way to an affirmation of diversity is open, opened in which the others seeing us is recognized as not threatening one's own seeing us, but instead as enriching it. This indicates the uh, possible solution to the conflict. Neither of the two parties to the dispute is right, nor is a possible third party. The solution might rather lie in the fact that the disputing parties change aspects and thereby realized that they confused and absolutized their respective relative seeing as with an objective perception. The solution here seems to be the relativization of the respective aspects, just as, just as Niels Bohr in a, famously, in a famous lecture of 1927, published one year later, tried to settle wave particle dualism by um, by through the principle of complementarity. So the principle of complementarity is has a side of kind of similarity with this. A Kippel thing in the sense that you acknowledge that there are two two possibilities. They seem to exclude each other, but you need both 
far have a better uh, explanation to speak of the phenomenon. So it's not the complementarity in the sense of power. It's not just two. It's not the classical understanding of comp two things that complement each other. No, they are in a certain sense intentional. To that. It makes it more interesting. But if you take a close, closer look, we see that the basis of this interpretation is wrong. The issue here is not the clash between two sides, each with aspect blindness, between two sorts of aspect blindness. For the cartoon, whether the author intended it or not, obviously goes beyond such an arrogant relativism here um, or pluralism. For if there were indeed two forms of complementary, complementary aspect blindness here, how could the armies recognize that the other were fighting under the banner of another god? Would they not necessarily recognize their own god in the banner of the other if they were aspect blind and thus be unable to recognize, recognize the others as enemies? So in a certain sense, one could make, even make the point that aspect blindness would, would be the best form of of not having a conflict because they don't even see that the other sees something in a different way. No? At the view of the cartoon, at least, the general of the army, you can see him with the um, in front of the picture on the, on the left side. Um, in the foreground, knows very well that the others worship another god under the same banner see the duck rabbit as something different. So he is not at all more stupid in this than the aspect seeing cartoon viewer. The obvious aggressiveness goes out here from exactly that one who is without doubt capable of the aspect change. Confusingly, it thus turns out that the one who relativizes, relativized himself or was able to relativize his own view comes close to the one he thought he could devalue as an aspect blind fanatic. So this is my, my major point here. Um, in the moment we understand that actually we have not two forms of aspect blindness, but the most aggressive figure here is able and capable of seeing the other side as well. We ourselves have to then to reflect our own epistemic superiority you know, as viewer of this cartoon. And we are we come much closer to this figure here, to the to the most aggressive one. Because we ourselves thought ourselves to be. Super, super, superior to this stupid armies here, no me, me, medieval armies. We were in a similar situation actually. Then the general, the general here, who see, apparently seems to be to think himself as superior to the, the opposite side. So while here in the in the cartoon we have an army in front of him, we have two armies in front of us, but it's the same. We are we are superior. No, we are able to, as we thought we were able to do something which we thought they were not able. So the observer comes to recognize herself exactly at that other at whom she had just smiled in a superior and mocking fashion, that is, as its double. This is what makes this insight uncanny. Instead of a new aspect appearing here, an aha moment, and, introdu and introducing a difference, a split, one could say um, a chasm, a picture chasm, in, uh, in the image, here is exactly the, the other way around. A difference disappears. I recognize the similarity between me and the devalued image I made of the other. And this is what I call because because this disappearance of an image, a sort of a difference, which was introduced by the 
aspect change, but the aha movement, I speak of a negative aha moment. And by this alignment, it becomes recognizable that I regarded the other side, the aspect blind, religious fanatics, no less as potential enemies than the general in the cartoon regarded the others. Or with other words, the observer is in the battlefield, not beyond it. I would like to point out that the cartoon also articulates a remarkable claim of one's own historical superiority of the observer of the cartoon, an implicit thinking of progress, as was the case again and again in modernity, but which is perhaps already inherent in Christian supersessionism. This claim lies in the assumption that it was the other who were arrested in a friend for thinking and that they were thus still in, in the Middle Ages in, and in a religious mindset. The so-called return of religion appears here as an enormous non-simultaneity, um, uh, um, uh, what is the term in, uh, in, in Ernst Bloch? Um, uh, Ungleichzeitigkeit, the, the technical term. Um, um, and so I think the, 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 here is, so you, you see the kind of uh, coming, the, uh, the return of religion, but in a kind of Ungleichzeitigkeit, a strange unsimultaneity from, from a specific perspective. Um, you may object um, now that this is only a cartoon and, and that I exaggerate its importance a little bit. But doesn't something similar occur again and again? Isn't the impression of non-simultaneity, Ungleichzeitigkeit, associated with the feeling of one's own historical advancement, the usual way in the, in, in the West to react to something unexpected? Even regarding the Ukraine war, you can find this topos of historical superiority. The idea that Putin is waging an anachronistic imperial war in the style of the 19th century and or early 20th century is very common among Western intellectuals. And even the Ukraine is often understood as being caught up in an outdated nationalism compared to our more advanced post-heroic and post-national Western society. So that is, this was precisely this, it was precisely this attitude that Jürgen Habermas articulated uh, quite clearly in his much discussed text on the war in the Ukraine. So here you can see this uh, quote, but I don't I will not read it. And I also will not read the, um, but I just wanted to mention it's interesting that uh, it's somehow ironic actually, that the one who can be understood as the spiritual rector of that Frankfurt school from where um, uh, Habermas derived, criticized in front of another war precisely the concept of history that is effective here. And I just also give you an, uh, an um, maybe I just read the last sentence here. Um, the current amazement that the thing we are experiencing are still possible in the 20th century is not philosophical. Um, this amazement is not the beginning of knowledge unless it is the knowledge that the view of history which gives rise to it is untenable. Unfortunately, now because of time, I cannot go deeper, but we can maybe in the discussion also re reflect this um, specific uh, historical um, superiority. Now I come to my last point. Sorry. Yes. But I said I have to. <laughs> need to. It's called questioning the questioning of one's own epistemic superiority. We all have experienced moments where the free play of interpretations is blocked. The appearance of an aspect can abruptly interrupt the game of interpretations. A spot on a computer tomography scan can mean an infinite numbers of things but as soon as it might also mean malignant tumor, the free play of interpretations of possibilities of seeing something as something um, already set in motion by the possibility of danger anyway, abruptly changes its character. Here, one aspect takes the upper hand, interrupting the free play. This is not because the other possibilities no longer exist or because suddenly, um, becomes aspect one becomes aspect blind, but because one kind of seeing as gains so much more existential weight than all others, 
which thus fade away, so to speak, and the perception narrows down and fixes itself on one possibility that seems relevant. And isn't that exactly what we are experiencing in view of Russia's war on Ukraine? Again, to this background, the question arises whether questioning the own superiority could perhaps go too far in specific situations at least. Whoever experiences this war as an existential threat, not only for Ukraine, but also for us, whoever sees here the outlines of a danger for freedom and for democracy, will have little understanding for someone who remains in the mode of self-critical questioning even in the face of the most obvious violence, injustice, and danger. And one could even say our impatience regarding the Putin Versteher, the understander, is a kind of hint of this. No, understander is normally something good. No, we would, would like to understand, to see, to have more perspective on the world. No, but in, but in specific moments, we seem to, as, as a kind of danger. No, you, you understand too much. The understander, so to speak, a kind of counter figure of the denier. Um, you, in this moment, you are the denier. You don't. You deny it that you could see things all in another way. No, you are in this kind. Of, so I could. We could talk about talk about this. Um, and even more, doesn't the attitude of questioning oneself even turns to become an epistemic and or moral vice? Doesn't epistemic modesty ultimately weaken our morale and thereby supports the aggressor? Does, in other words, the the present situation in which we find ourselves in Europe do not clearly show a limit to this self-questioning? But it's not that simple. First of all, by questioning self-questioning, the attitude of or praxis of self-questioning of critical of critics in a certain sense, the very same praxis is not thereby terminated, but applied to itself. So it is thus not simply termination, but also a confirmation of self-questioning, right? More importantly, questioning one's own superiority is not a relativistic or even nihilistic end in itself. It is based on an implicit, implicit normative precondition, the fight against hierarchies between human beings. Only based on a fundamental notion or value, if you want, or, or I don't know how we could we call of equality, is the questioning of unreflective and unfounded assumptions of super, superiority meaningful at all? Right? Do you understand? Is it okay? Was it too? Yeah. So, um, in other words, the precondition of questioning superiority is a kind of negative understanding of hierarchies. So um, you question this, and this is why you you do so. So in the, this reflection has also, therefore consequences for conflicts like the present one. It would be self-contradictory if self-questioning went so far as to question the opposition between authoritarianism and democracy, questioning the superiority of equality against suppression. In other words, here it, it is a clear and orienting, orienting limit. Thus, it is, no, it is in no way contradictory to a practice of questioning one's own moral, epistemic, political even, superiority to know oneself in a struggle with an opponent who violates the very equality behind it. And wasn't that exactly what I was saying before related to the negative aha moment? Here we recognize that we no longer recognize ourselves as super, superior observers, but as part partisan in a dispute, even in that field of, or, of struggle in which we previously saw the, the other comprehended. We ourselves are subject to that friend for logic in a certain sense, which we had previously attributed to the other. We are as non simultaneously, not simultaneous as we perceived them. However, in political conflicts, we rarely deal with a mere juxtaposition of contradictory opposites like democracy versus tyranny, peacefulness versus bellicosity, and so on. So in principle, this is we have this clear conference. 
while war can bring such contrasts more clearly to light, part of the fog of war, this is a famous notion, um, term by Klaus, Clausewitz, like Karl von Clausewitz, is perhaps the fact in the course of such conflicts, the parties tend too easily to see each other as representatives of such principles and to fail to recognize that the principled opposites, opposites are not so clearly distributed. On the contrary, the same conflict that brings contradictions to light also leads usually to an alignment of the two parties and the opposition, uh, opposites become confused. Escalating conflicts have the tendency toward what René Girard called violent imitation, which makes advers adversaries more and more alike. And at the same time, a bingling, willingness or ability to recognize or acknowledge this increasing similarity. Exactly this very tendency is addressed in the negative aha moment and which it might be an, anti any, an antidote to such escalation. I'm almost in the end of my talk. More generally, against the tendency to conform to the negative image one has of the other, the constant critical reflection of one's own assumptions of superiority seems helpful. We, the political we that constitutes itself in conflicts like the current one, should therefore not stop questioning the own implicit or explicit claims for superiority. It is, for example, certainly true what Guterres said, I quote, there is one thing that is true and obvious and that no argument can change. We have not Ukrainian troops in the territory of the Russian Federation, but we have Russian troops in the territory of Ukraine. But we should not forget how often our Western troops were and still are in other countries. The initial question about self-questioning and its limit is thus answered. We, by reflecting on its normative, on its normative presupposition, we arrive at a clear limit of self-questioning. It becomes self-contradictory to question the very basis and motivation of this very question. At the same time, self-questioning must not stop precisely if we do not want to fall back in an unreflected and unjustified claim of superiority, conform to the negative image we have of the, of, of the other and violate the egalitarian principle as well. I would like to end with a quotation by Karl Barth, formulated um, in a slightly similar situ situation like the current one, quite interesting text, um, because he paid attention, I think, in a certain sense, to both dimensions that I just, just mentioned. He wrote, this system, the German Nazism, can only deny the church, but also the church can only deny um, this system. But it would be good if you, as Christians and theologians, are now also interested in the fact that Europe, by retreating step by step from the dictatorship of myths, by bowing to its methods, and making them its own is about to become a madhouse. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Luca. And then we will have the next keynote, Ella. Uh, as you will see, I'm going to refer to uh, to uh, one of the texts that we discussed earlier, the Heidegger. I begin with hermeneutics, namely by referring my beginning to another beginning, by positing my talk within an already ongoing conversation, ours. We are talking about epistemic virtues and the practice of dialogue. This is the main theme and beginning of our current conversation. I begin by reading this title, this inaugural speech, Epistemic Virtues and Practice of Dialogue, 
is bespeaking the relation between knowledge and language, both understood as praxis, as performances. Knowledge is a matter of virtue. Language is practice of dialogue. The underline hinted it, rather than explicit question, so I read the title, is practical, not only in the sense that it concerns praxis, but because it concerns normativity, virtue. Namely, it concerns the ethics of knowledge and language. The ethical question revolves around the practice of dialogue. The notion of dialogue here is today an evident ethical, moral significance within epistemology. Dialogue names a certain contemporary ethics of knowledge and thought. More specifically, the notion of dialogue is intimately related to the normative idea of epistemic difference, namely the idea of knowledge, practice of knowledge, which resists unity and totality, resists the totalization of knowledge, both in theory and in politics. To use the terms of our conversation, the practice of dialogue in contemporary discourse stands for the epistemic virtue of difference, otherness, diversity, pluralism. Dialogue, the logos that is more than one, dual or plural, both guarantees and performs pluralism within knowledge. In this sense, dialogue is a logo epistemic practice that counters other monolithic and totalizing practices such as monologue, dialectics, or logics. My basic epistemological attempt is to think about dialogue within the broader perspective of what may be called the break or rupture of logos as a contemporary epistemic device, which is not vice, but virtue. We can talk about a contemporary practice of, as I already said, logoclasm, a normative breaking of the logos. I suggest to situate the ethical epistemic question of dialogue within a broader contemporary discourse concerning the practice or ethics, also the politics of resistance to logos, a resistance to the practice of logos, namely to logging, to speaking. It is in this precise sense that I speak of not speaking. Can we speak of dialogue as a practice of not speaking? I do think the notion of dialogue and of dialogical thinking are currently deployed within a logoclastic discourse. Nonetheless, does dialogue really counter logging? Isn't dialoguing the very performance and dissemination of logos. And if so, wouldn't dialogue not so much contradict monologue as complement or perfect it? Is dialogue really the guarantee of epistemic difference? Wouldn't the existence of dialogue already signify the fundamental overcoming of difference, the reproduction of logos in dia logos? Isn't dialogue the enactment of speaking as establishing the coherence of logos? the unity of language? Wouldn't the encounter with real difference, with real alterity, deep epistemic, linguistic, cultural alterity imply, in contrast, the impossibility of dialogue, the end of speaking? Wouldn't therefore the embrace of epistemic difference require something like what I called an ethics of not speaking, a logoclastic practice of silence? I will now reflect on these questions hermeneutically, once again, by intervening on and in an already going conversation, by entering a dialogue with a dialogue of sorts, or more precisely, by speaking with a Gespräch. What I refer to is uh, Heidegger's text that we uh, discussed earlier, uh, that was offered as a source for our own discussion aus einem Gespräch von der Sprache zwischen einem Japaner und einem Fragenden. I will now suggest a reading of this text, 
as a logo plastic exercise is an attempted enactment of not speaking in the name and for the sake of epistemic difference. This is how I'm going to read this text. In a nutshell, my claim is that this attempt ultimately fails. Heidegger's attempt at logoclasm fails. Yet at the same time, before the ultimate, before the eschaton, it does provide valuable insights into what may be called the practice of logoclastic speech. A first logoclastic speech that arises from the interlinguistic performance of Heidegger's text is its English translation by Peter Herz. As we shall see, the English title, A Dialogue on Language, both renders and distorts, namely erases and silences the German title, Aus einem Gespräch von der Sprache, from a conversation of language. Translation is silence by speech. But as I said, Heidegger's own speech act, his own text, is a logoclastic performance, a staging of not speaking. A fundamental element of silence lies already in the staging that constitutes the literary genre of dialogue. The philosophical text, the logos, is not delivered directly is a conceptual immediacy, but mediated through individual speakers, broken in particular bodies, namely non-logical, non-linguistic entities. The dialogue is not only an exchange of words, but a happening that takes place between and through persons, a drama, a play, which consists in silent acts. In, and this is a central word in this entire text, Gebärde, gestures. The drama of Heidegger's text is a performance <coughs> of difference, an encounter between individuals that embody different cultures, as we say today, or different epistemes, as I suggest, or as Heidegger writes, different worlds, languages, and Sprachgeists, different thinkings and designs. The text is a fiction inspired by a real meeting that took place apparently in the mid 50s between Heidegger and the Japanese professor Tomio Tezuka. The two different epistemes that the two interlocutors represent are identified in the text as on the one hand European or sometimes Abendländlich, that is Occidental or Western, never German, and on the other hand, Japanese or East Asian. Note in passing that this specific constellation of difference within a post-World War II German text already signifies within a historical, political, cultural, and even scientific logos in which Europe's East Asian other is deployed as alternative, replacement, and effacement of Europe's other other, namely the West Asian, the Semite. The more explicit European German framing of the conversation, zwischen einem Japaner und einem Fragenden, beyond the obvious fact that it takes place in German, is also evident in the identification vis a vis the Japanese speaker of the European speaker, namely Heidegger himself, not as a European, but uh, as Luca already pointed out, as Fragen, an inquirer or questionnaire. Whereas the Japanese is a particular cultural identity, the questionnaire, Fragende, is a mode of logos, a general form of speech. Finally, notwithstanding the symmetrical form of the dialogical exchange, the dramatic event of this intercultural encounter is clearly driven and moved by the European party, the inquirer, inquirer the verb, whereas the named Japanese is mostly moved, responding, reacting. The basic plot, as I wish now to show, is the collapse of logos in the inter-epistemic difference. What I will call the first act of the play, I look at it as a theatrical event, features the logoclastic event, the end of speaking, that is the break or the death of the dialogue. The second act, 
features something like resurrection. We are never far here from theology. Indeed, the entire text offers a sort of eschatology, a discourse of absence in view of an ultimate presence. More precisely, a conversation between different languages in the absence of common logos, but in view of its coming. I quote as a motto, the messianic epistemological vision that Heidegger, the inquirer, formulates at one point of the exchange when he wonders, I quote, whether in the end, which would also be the beginning, an essence of language can arrive in the thinking experience and offer the assurance that European Western saying and East Asian saying will enter into a conversation to sing something that wells up from a single source. Act one, death of a dialogue. The inquirer's conversation with the Japanese fashions itself as a memory, commemoration, or andenken of another earlier conversation between Heidegger and another Japanese thinker, a, a Japanese thinker, Count Shuzo Kuki, who in 1933 published the first Japanese book on Heidegger. The exchange begins symbolically with the contemplation of Kuki's death, which announces the demise or failure in retrospect of the Japanese's historical dialogue with Heidegger. Kuki's inter-epistemic attempt in approaching Heidegger, we are told, was to conceptualize the essence of Japanese art, which he designated by the Japanese word iki, I'm also not sure how to say it, by using European aesthetics. It is this project, this historical dialogue, that Heidegger now, 20 years later, in the 50s, harshly criticizes. Aesthetics, he says, both the name and what it names originate in European thought, in philosophy. For this reason, Heidegger says, aesthetical contemplation must remain fundamentally foreign to East Asian thought. End of quote. Any attempt to understand Japanese art with European aesthetics must fail. The problem is not just aesthetics. Heidegger's critique concerns the very foundation of dialogue, namely language. Conversation between European and East Asian thought is impossible not only because they have different aesthetics, but because they speak different languages. To understand the problem, we must recall Heidegger's conception of language, which resists a common understanding of language as a system of arbitrary signs for non-linguistic reality. And instead conceives language, to use Heidegger's famous phrase, as the house of being. Namely, language is the matrix of our world. Note that Heidegger's conception is in fact not attached to the perception of language as a specific system of science, German, French, English, Japanese, etc., but refers to the system of signified meanings. At one point, he writes Sprachgeist, which defines not a system of science, but a system of existence, of being, a world, a culture, a civilization which may be common to multiple semantic systems. The problem in Kuki's attempted dialogue was not the semantic or grammatical differences between Japanese and German tongues. Rather, it was the epistemic categorical gap between the European and the East Asian discourses and worlds, between their different houses of being. We European, Heidegger says, probably live in a completely different house than the East Asian man, end of quote. The houses, the languages are most fundamentally different in their understanding of what is at all language, of the essence or being, the basin of language. The different languages are therefore different in their very existence, in their being language. European language, either argues, arises from the basic European epistem, metaphysics. European language is based on, I quote, the metaphysical distinction between sensuous and supersensuous, namely between the material, physical sign, the sound, the script, and the ideal, metaphysical signification. 
since the European and East Asian languages are not just semantically, but existentially, ontologically different, Heidegger concludes, I quote, a conversation from house to house remains almost, almost impossible. This impossibility of intercultural dialogue is not merely theoretical, but ethical. The attempt to enter into this almost impossible conversation is not only doomed to fail, it is also dangerous. The inquirer's gespräch with the Japanese is imbued with a sense of danger, gefahr, and a feeling of fear and apprehension, befürchtung, namely from some catastrophe, some destruction, some death. The danger lies in the conversation itself, in the impossible but nonetheless attempted dialogue between the ontologically different European and East Asian languages. Count Shuzukuki's exchanges with Heidegger were held in German, in European language. Accordingly, so Heidegger's hindsight, the, I quote, language of the conversation destroyed the possibility of saying what was spoken of, namely the essence of Japanese art, Iki. The dialogue did not simply fail to bring to light what was discussed. It actively pushed it into oblivion, concealed and erased, silenced it. Dialogue is silence. Cookie's silencing speech, like an act of translation, had effaced the Japanese essence of Iki by understanding the tension between its two elements, Iro and Ku, as the metaphysical tension between sensuous and supersensuous. The first act of the Gespräch between Heidegger and the Japanese therefore consists in a devastating critique and self-critique of the earlier Gespräch between Heidegger and the Japanese as an event of destruction and obliteration of Japan by Europe. Note that the conversation explicitly contextualizes this interpersonal drama within the history of European colonialism, the encounter between the East Asian and European world, albeit dangerous and destructive, has become at the same time, the Japanese interlocutor indicate, inescapable due to the total Europeanization of the earth and the human. Europeanization is the imperial colonial intercultural encounter in which the uninterrupted progress of the dialogos simultaneously spreads destruction and silence. More concretely, the text speaks of, I quote, modern techno technologization and industrialization, through which the non-European world takes the shape, adopts the language of Europe. Just like Kuki erased Iki by presenting it in the terms of Western aesthetics, the film Rashomon, they speak about it, wiped out the Japanese world by rendering it visible as the object of photography. Act one brings forth, therefore, the logoclasm, the death of dialogue, the death that is dialogue. The climax of this act is the actual enactment of the logoclastic moment, the enactment of silence within the dialogue. The enactment takes place as Heidegger, the inquirer, having contemplated the disaster of his earlier dialogue with Cookie, nonetheless attempts to renew the European East Asian conversation by putting an interpistemic question to the Japanese, which addresses the most contentious matter, that is the essence of language. I quote, do you have in your language a word for what we call language, Sprache? After all that has been said by Heidegger about the impossibility, danger, and destructiveness of historical European East Asian conversation, the Japanese cannot but be taken aback by this new and direct question. He begs for some moments of reflection and then stops talking, falls into silence. The silence is inscribed in the text as the cessation of the direct dialogical exchange and the conversation breaking into silent, individual, non-communicative gestures, which are rendered like stage directions in a parenthetical, external, and distant voice. In parentheses, I quote, the Japanese closes his eyes, lowers his head, and sinks into a long reflection. The inquirer waits until his guest resumes the conversation. End of quote. 
act two, cookie resurrected. The question concerning the essence of language, which brings to light the epistemic different, silences the logos. Yet the inquirer waits until his guest resumes the conversation. As already noted, Heidegger tells not just the story of death, but of resurrection. We already heard the logo eschatology. I quote again, whether in the end, which would also be the beginning, an essence of language can arrive in the thinking experience and offer the assurance that European Western saying and East Asian saying will enter into a conversation to sing something that wells up from a single source, end of quote. It is precisely this messianic vision, this end of the end, the break of silence, but voices joined in song, which act two of the drama now sets out to stage. To the silent Japanese interlocutor, rendered apprehensive, speechless, by Heidegger's threats of destruction and the memory of Count Cookie's failure in act one, Heidegger in act two offers a way out, a salvation or redemption in the form of a losingness vault, a solving, saving, liberating word a word to redeem the conversation from silence without breaking the silence, a word from a conversation of silence. The saving word that Heidegger offers is wink. That is a hinting gesture, a wave or a nod, a speechless saying. It is in fact by a series of gestures that the dialogue between the Japanese and the inquirer is resurrected. The first redeeming gesture is the very question that brings forth the silence, namely the inquirer's question about the Japanese word for language, to which the Japanese withholds his answer. This withholding, this non-speech, however, is itself already an answer, a response, a communicative reaction to the inquirer's question, which notwithstanding the failure of the previous dialogue with Count Kuki, now gestures the possibility of recommencing the European East Asian exchange. The Japanese silent response to this prompt is accordingly inscribed in Heidegger's text as a new moment in the dialogue. The Japanese closes his eyes, lowers his head, and sinks into a long reflection. The inquirer waits until his guest resumes the conversation. The second redeeming gesture is offered by the inquirer, the Heidegger persona, in view of the Japanese's hesitation to answer the question on Japanese language by regaining agency over the exchange and switching the direction of the inquiry, such that the inquirer becomes now the respondent. In an attempt to unburden the Japanese from the responsibility of resuming a conversation with European thought that Heidegger just argued is disastrous, Heidegger suggests that the fiasco of Count Kuki's project of translating Japanese iki into metaphysical terms nonetheless arouse from a more fundamental, more genuine question that had originally driven Kuki to Heidegger and which is still open, still alive. To overcome the death of the dialogue in Heidegger's question to the Japanese, Heidegger rehabilitates the memory of the late Count Kuki by resuscitating the Japanese's original question to Heidegger and by offering an answer. As it turns out, Japan's original question to the German philosopher concerned the meaning of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, Heidegger now explains, is Europe's theologically inspired reflection on the relation between the word and the being. That is Europe's reflection on the essence of language. It thus transpires that Heidegger's question to the Japanese about the essence of Japanese language is the same as the Japanese's original question to Heidegger. Heidegger's third gesture is to offer an answer to what now transpires as the common European East Asian question on the essence of language. The main thrust of the conception of language offered by Heidegger to the Japanese is that it is not metaphysical. It is not based on the distinction between material sign and ideal meaning. It is not originally a language of signs in which speaking is separated from being, in which we speak about or on being. 
Rather, Heidegger's non-metaphysical language, not Sprache, but Sage, consists in speaking that is being, namely in saying not through signs and ciphers, but through gestures, Gebärde, such as nods and waves, saying in Winken. In a revealing moment of the conversation, which announces the coming redemption, the Japanese indicates the manifestation of Heidegger's non-metaphysical language of gestures in Japanese traditional no theater, an indication that is once again inscribed in the text in the form of a parenthetical description of a silent gesture that you put also on the board. The Japanese raises his hand and holds it in the described manner. The inquirer's gesture towards the Japanese thus consists in signaling an internal European self-critique and disengagement from the language of metaphysics. This gesture is extended by Heidegger's signaling to his Japanese interlocutor his own logoclastic situation within the European conversation, namely Heidegger's own inner European silence or conditions of not speaking. This inner logoclasm appears both in the confusion of Western thinkers with respect to Heidegger's language, for instance, concerning his use of words such as nichts or being, the break of logos is also enacted actively by Heidegger himself in his reluctance, so he tells the Japanese, to publish his famous lecture on language precisely due to his fear, which the existing English translation confirms, that it will be read metaphysically as speaking on language. Sprechen Übersprache. What Heidegger would like to offer in contrast, as the inquirer explains to the silent Japanese, his non-metaphysical vision consists in speaking of language, sprechen von der Sprache, namely in speech that arises from and enacts or performs being. Such speaking of language, sprechen von der Sprache, Heidegger says, can only take place as an explicit event of sprechen, in Gespräch, namely in conversation, which must remain an ongoing event must remain, note the messianic verb, incoming. For a conversation to remain incoming, so Heidegger's gesture to the silent Japanese, it must consist in more silence than talk. Or as the Japanese immediately adds, in silence on silence. This series of gestures offered by the inquirer Finally, we assure the Japanese who is reduced to silence by the radical alienation effected by the opening act and now senses in the non-metaphysical thinking of Heidegger, as he says, I quote, a deeply concealed kinship with our own thinking, precisely because your Heidegger path of thinking and its language are so wholly other, end of quote. The reassured Japanese now finds the confidence to finally answer the inquirer's question as to the Japanese name and essence of language. The Japanese word that he offers is kotoba, which he translates as the leaves or petals ba of the event of the message of grace, koto. The Japanese essence of language would consist in the living beauty arising from the event of speech, inseparably intertwining speaking and being, word and flesh, similarly to Heidegger's theologically inspired hermeneutics. Heidegger's eschatological vision, whether in the end, which would also be the beginning, an essence of language can arrive in the thinking experience and offer the assurance that European Western saying and East Asian saying will enter into a conversation to sing something that wells up from a single source. This vision is thus unexpectedly soon materialized. The Dialogical thinking experience arrives at a common European, East Asian, non-metaphysical conception of language, and this harmony expresses itself in the conversation itself, in a number of key moments toward the end, when the two interlocutors complete each other's phrases in perfect continuity, such that the dialogical exchange transforms into, into a monologue, a, du a duet singing. I quote, one of the last moment, the Japanese says, saying then is not the, is not the name for human speaking. And in, immediately the inquirer, but for the essential being to which your Japanese word kotoba 
waves, the Zagenhaft, the fabulous, and immediately the Japanese, and in whose waving I only now, through our conversation, have come to be at home. So that now I also see more clearly how well advised Count Kuki was when he, under your guidance, tried to reflect his way through hermeneutics. I conclude by pointing out how the conversation with Heidegger brings the Japanese back to himself, to the original intention of Count Kuki and to Japanese language and thought. What begins as a logoclasm, a sober break of dialogue with anti-colonial tones, ends with a romantic, almost pathetic hymn of post-colonial redemption, where Europe once again plays the savior. Ultimately, one gets the impression that in the text, the Japanese, similarly to Hölderlin or Anaximander, is just another literary figure in Heidegger's internal monologue, more precisely a figure of Heidegger's own quest of breaking with metaphysics and his alleged alienation from European philosophy. Nonetheless, I do find important Heidegger's acute sense of the epistemopolitical danger of intercultural and inter-epistemic conversation and his ensuing formulation and performance of logoclastic communicative action. Most particularly, I highlight in this text the performative notion of speechless speech, a conversation of silences, which could be a model for something like an inter-epistemic ethics of not speaking. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, Luca, would you like to sing next to Elab? We have a dialogue between you, and then we open up to the whole audience. Um. I uh, I actually I'm, I'm not sure I I, I ask myself often the question uh, of what what is the perform the this genre of perform conversation dialogues um, what does it precisely uh, do uh, because it's a it's a very specific genre with which I admit that I've never I've never felt quite comfortable you know this kind of panel discussion and where uh, you are invited to talk with someone about something uh, especially if someone that you know. Like, uh, like, like in our situation where you talk a lot, and then the question is, what happened when it's kind of a performance where you're supposed now to talk, so to speak, uh, to each other, but also we know we are through you and so to speak, speaking to uh, to others. Um, I'm I'm not so sure about it. Uh, I, uh, um, I I I imagine that 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 it. Um, it puts some kind of a obligation of the conversation to be more articulate than perhaps you would usually do uh, when you speak to each other. Uh, and perhaps in a sense, it, uh, <clears throat> it, it, you become, so to speak for me, just a channel to speak to uh, uh, a filter, so to speak, a filter to speak uh, to others. So just this is a, maybe, this is a kind of reflection on our conversation now. Maybe to, I would like to just to jump in your your presentation. In the case of Heidegger, I I think what he is performing here in in converse, conversation with another um, Eastern Asian is something he performed with the own culture, with his 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 own training was already to question their own terms own. Making them more and more problematic in front of maybe a tradition, and so, so in other words, um, is it not? And you in on in your presentation, you also used this distinction between dialogue and monologue. But is it accurate to to make this distinction? Is it aren't we not not constantly in a kind of inner dialogue? Is what we call monologue? always a kind of dialogue. I think Hannah Arendt went a little bit in this direction. Um, well, I, I, I guess when you push it further, any, <clears throat> so to speak, any movement of your knowledge or more specifically of your mind to whatever direction 
without uh, a complete collapse of your psyche, uh, which would be imaginable, um, could be said uh, to be to remain within some kind of the general framework that that maintains the mono. And perhaps this is I also correlated to the hypo's direction uh, in this transcendental one that has to be some kind of precondition for any kind or even a very radical kind of conversation. Uh, so I, I guess you could always go in this direction. And we have uh, uh, the wonderful philosopher Hegel, who basically, uh, that was the thesis, right? The, the entire development of all the possible positions in the history of thinking and knowledge uh, could be uh, presented as, as the movement of one guy that, 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 that alienates itself from itself sees itself as something completely different, is surprised by itself, and so forth and so forth, but always remains uh, nonetheless uh, nonetheless the same. Uh, so to some extent, you could always argue this. Uh, I, nonetheless, uh, I, nonetheless I, 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 I take very seriously uh, different contestations of, of, of this view, uh, that that that, that try, try to present uh, models in which uh, in which there is some kind of a, of, a, of a serious otherness uh, that that uh, that that in a sense does present a a, a threat to the um, to the wholeness of the, of the psyche or the civilization that we, in which you're in, and in this sense, I think when Heidegger speaks about danger. Uh, he, I think he understands what he means. He means it's not just, uh, you know, you understood something new. Oh, interesting. Or you knew, uh, you, uh, you found out a new way of cooking pasta or something like that, right? You, you know, so you, 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 we, we learn, we, we, you grow or something like that. No, he speaks about something that uh, on the individual level, yes, might break your psyche, you know, some kind of understanding that is, you know, essentially life changing, perhaps devastating. And on cultural civilizational level, yes, it, it may represent some kind of a, of, a, of, a, of an apocalypse, a catastrophe. You know, the messianic moment is not just a, a, a happy moment, uh, but but is is constitute uh, the, the the coming uh, revolution and catastrophe that can be something very violent. Uh, so, in this sense, it would no longer then be uh, a monologue, but something that is really maybe also not a dialogue. Is what I mean, not a log, but something that. I breaks it. Maybe the la last thing I had regarding Heidegger, um, you mentioned this catastrophe, you know, with um, with this professor and the non-understanding and so on. But of course, if you read, if you if you deal with Heidegger, you there's also another catastrophe, you know, and there's was another word which was missing, but it was his own word regarding Auschwitz, which was missing which everybody was requesting from him and he didn't actually even if they asked him so he he denied to answer you know, in the sense but in the sense of uh, but i don't want to go in this direction but um when i was reading the schwarze hälfte and the black notebooks i i had even made a document about what he's speaking about the asiatic so i, had a, I have here all all um gathering of what he speak, says about the asiatic and this is so to speak, terrible. It's really terrible. What he's, um, I don't, don't want to, to go in, but it's um, o o almost always negative, grauenhafter as jede asiatische Wildheit. I don't, I want to, don't want to go in this, but it is it's full of negatives. Um, so, but this is the other, no? It's also the other, uh, even the, the dangerous other, the, the the, the, the term the biggest danger comes here very often. The Asiatic is, so to speak, the enemy. And what I found interesting regarding this move to the post-war text is, first of all, a kind of something is still the same. It's, it's the other, but now it's it's yeah, it's seen in a less the German and the Japanese. In fact, this is another thing I wanted to just, of course, it's also interesting to, to notice that these are both the losers of the Second World War coming in a certain sense together. No? So this is not just something which is far away, but in a certain sense, they, they 
have a similar um, experience regarding maybe the Western world, regarding mm -hmm. um, a closeness here, no? And this makes mm -hmm. everything much more amb ambiguous, maybe more ambivalent. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting. So, so about, about the Asian, this is why I said it's interesting that he insists on the East Asian uh, in contradistinction to the what? To the non-East Asian, who is nonetheless still Asian, namely the West Asian, namely the Semitic. Uh, and it's this is why I, I, I only gestured in this direction, but definitely this is why I said it's inscribed within a, an entire tradition uh 19th century 18 already 18 but the 19th century this whole movement of uh trying to locate you know the real essence of europe uh uh in Sato's christianity uh not in the uh, uh west a asia uh, so it's not a semitic origin but uh precisely the yeah. east uh in the east so this entire going back you know there is a whole literature you know whole genre of of uh they go to the buddha you know uh, this is this is the real uh uh, uh 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 this is the real christ the buddha uh and 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 and, and many other tropes you know the the, the of course the indo Euro the, the indo european uh and and so so it's it's a, it's a whole trope w within which this conversation definitely should be read and i agree with you that uh it's uh it's it's in in this sense it's it it does it doesn't uh, enact so much a break with uh in, with the war period but actually also a certain continuity and this is comes out of the dialogue this is productive dialogue um that very term hermeneutic which is so crucial here for the early for the high deck of the 20s this was also a notion which which um informed him or which was important for a historical for the for his for his understanding of historicity, Geschichtlichkeit. Because we are in hermeneutical, um, so coming from Dilta mm -hmm. and so and this was exactly against the ah historicity of the Asiatic. Mm -hmm. For him, the Asiatic doesn't think in, in historical terms in the mm -hmm. 20s, 30s, mm -hmm. 30s. In other words, this very the crucial term here in um, uh, of uh, hermeneutics is also a term which was which was crucial for a devaluating or for the biggest danger perceived by by the European by, by the German actually or by the high by high in this yeah. as uh, the confrontation with a world which loses its historicity loses a Geschichtlichkeit mm. yeah the, the, at the same time at the same time it's interesting this is one of the only texts or the, one of the few texts in which uh, Heidegger makes a uh, uh, positive or uh, direct also reference to the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and here through hermeneutics, he makes, he says specifically, I came to the, to the theology where you had to all the time think about the uh, relation between systematic theology, so the more conceptual and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and scripture, so the text to the text. So this is one of the actually places where uh, you you can actually go back to theology and even Judeo-Christian somewhat uh, uh, tradition. I just just uh, I just want to highlight one thing that you said that's interesting, and I want to um, emphasize it. This interesting, uh, perhaps feeling that Heidegger here incorporates of post-war Germany of being the 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 the, the, the other within the West, the other of the West, mm -hmm. which is which is an interesting thing that the, the, so the inner post-colonial understanding of, of, of Germans after the war. Thank you.